You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, goddammit! Get the point. Good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Oh, hey, guess what? I made it back. <laughs> Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocketeer here on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 3. Also on the RLM Radio.xyz site, the RLM TuneIn Radio Station, the RLM Internet Radio Station, the RLM Spreaker Channel. And if you are listening on Spreaker, Please come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. Give me static because I got crap internet and I can't do that many chat rooms at one time. So, oh, see, Grimmy, I don't need to be totally retrained, although I almost missed my cue. <laughs> Holy sheep dip. It's been a wild couple of weeks in Grammy land. And I'm playing catch-up, actually, the last couple of days. I don't know if I'm Heinz or if I'm, uh, what's the other brand? Hunt's. And there used to be a really good catch-up called Brooks. It was spicy. Oh, I love that stuff. And they quit making it. It's like, what the hell? In any case, um, yeah, I'm playing catch-up. After having grandkids for a week and then doing family things and then running into massive thunder boomers while trying to get the grandkids back to their mom yeah adventures <laughs> adventures i've been having lots of them so hi sock puppet i see you x-rated yes uh-huh sometimes it can be um let's see Vinny's back too hi Vinny. okay i need to say hey to everywhere else first over on fakey book don't know what's going on but there's gal at uh, dearly.com posted a video woman spoofs perfect model pics with spot-on impressions and oh my god bless her heart there's a couple of those things I don't think I would want to try and do because I'd probably hurt myself <laughs> but she's funny as hell she's an Instagram queen and I tell you what I love her I love her she's hilarious some gal from down under other than that I don't know that there's anybody really uh, Hi, Eric. I see you, sweetheart. Um, over on that Freedoms Network. Thank you, Grimmy, for tweeting me out or sharing me or however. Yeah, yeah, that thing. That right there. Because I'm live right now, I think. I'm still sweating like a stuck hog. I just actually, at about um, 426, I finished mowing. My riding mower was not wanting to start, so I push mowed. And I'm very, very hot and sticky no it wasn't 426 it was 516 that's what it was yeah because it was it was like shit i don't have time to jump in the shower i guess good thing that this isn't a smellow cast because <laughs> i'm ripe <laughs> well i don't know that i'm ripe but ooh wee hmm i still got my cold wash rag around my neck too because it's warm outside and i got a sunburn on my face and on my arms so yay Yeehaw! It is the start of the Grammy Cracker, or the Neapolitan Grammy. However, I'm three flavors all in one. Okay, over here on Twitter, thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. Who in the hell is this gal with the f messed up eyes? Damn it. Damn it, sweetheart. You need to... Okay, and, and I see it's Bill Mitchell shared this, and it says... Um, uh, blow out jobs numbers and I swear to God I know this will shock you guys but when I read that it was like blow job numbers <laughs> oh my lord and looking at her yeah she mm, I'll just move along so hi everybody over on Twitter that's listening in um, hi, soul filing cabinets. How are you doing, sweetheart? Uh, yeah, you're probably going to get shocked a time or two because I have a tendency to, uh, yeah, 
go a little off kilter. Okay, over here on mines, I don't know what the hell's going on over here on mines, too. I got a shitload of notifications over here, and they were all about something somebody posted in a group, and it's like, okay, thank you. Hi, I've been here 2017. I see you, sweetheart. Uh, let's see, what's that? When exposing a crime is treated as committing a crime, you are ruled by criminals. No doubt. No doubt. And I do have something along those lines for you here in just a little bit. But first, I gotta say hey to everybody over here in the RLM. <laughs> Oh, sock, you silly man. That's why I love you. Okay, over here in the RLM, which is where you really need to be if you want to give me static. They're already catching up and giving me all kind of static. So, um, hi, barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know? The lovely moose girl is here. Hey, woman, how's life now that the boys are da, 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 of age? I also see the lovely Kate is here. How's things down in the great state of Florida? I have an article from there too, Kate. I also see Asmo is here. Hey, Asmo. I saw the lovely Beth Z. Is she still logged in? But she was chitty chatting earlier this morning before she went out and played in the garden. And uh, yeah, playing in the garden before it gets too hot is usually a good idea. And But it was too too soggy for me to mow that early in the day. So, it was still kind of soggy, because like in the last, well, we didn't get any rain last night, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we got rain, and we got probably close to five inches of rain in those three days, which is an awful lot for us in three days, although there's a farmer <clears throat> just about 45 miles west of me that those big ass storms that were going through Monday when I was really wanting to get my grandkids back to their mommy, um, they decided to dump a bucket on a couple of towns and one farmer recorded seven and a half inches of rain in one hour. And yeah, you could tell what farm it was because driving by, because the, they said he was right off of I-70 and yeah, driving by, you could see it. He had soggy, soggy everywhere in his fields and the cattle had to be moved because their cattle corral was a pond and yeah it, mother nature's been having fun with us lately in any case hello doozer doozer my doozer kitty's on my lap mainly because she wants her canned cat food and too bad you gotta wait till mommy gets done on the radio okay hi 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 Chloe, toss a cherry tomato my way too, sweetheart. You know, don't be just tossing them at all the guys. What the hell? Okay. Who do I need to... Ah, yeah, Beth Z was out playing in the garden. That's why I went off on a tangent. Chalcedony is also in the chat as well as Chloe. E -e 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 -e, the cherry tomato lobbing crazy woman. And not lobbing none my direction. Damn it. One, two, three, four. We're going to have a hug war. Hugs. I'm armed and ready. Get it? Armed for a hug. <laughs> Moving along. I'm here. Hi. <laughs> yes, that's for grapefruit. Flash. <laughs> I also see Ibi Donsi and Ibi Donsi Woik is here. As well as Java 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 Doctor 2. And looky there, Juana Taco. I wanted to do that last night, but my taco meat was not, yeah. It had to go to the compost. Darn it. So, hmm. Fix something different. Uh, let's see. The lovely Rain is in the house. Hey, Rain. How you doing? I also see RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. Rob Works, who doesn't do tomatoes. Shame on you, Rob. Tomatoes are yummy, yummy, good for the tummy. But Rob does pass around the bubbler. So, you know, we will let him slide on that one. Just just for once. Um, I also see Trust No One is here. Hey, you trusty feller. How you doing? And uh, Beetle! Beetle had awesome, 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 possum, awesome sauce news about his son that he shared today. Sweet. I, you should be so proud of him. I'm proud of him, and I don't even know him. Good 
job, Marshall. Um, I also see the lovely Cycles is here. Hi, Cycles. And uh, Colfax101 is logged in, but away. I also see Dimma, as well as Flash Nasty, who's, who's splatting things. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sock puppet. Taco meat. <laughs> okay. Hi, Frumpy. And yeah, that gal on Amazon. Ooh, I was really afraid to open that link. Really, because, whoa. She, she, she starts talking about oils, and it's like, oh. I wonder if KY was involved with any of that. <laughs> Hi, Guest 91. How are you doing this evening? I also see Kozu is in the house, as well as Moi, 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 Moi. And we have a pox upon thee. We have a pox box, poxified, poxophone, poxy home. Lots of poxes going on. And Pop Upon Sauce, as well as Sock Puppet, who's being very frisky this evening. Sock, you frisky boy, you. I also see Skittle, as well as Vinny. Hi, Vinny. Long time no see. I haven't. I may have been. I may have been logged in, but I've been busy. I had. Did, did I tell you I had grandkids? Yeah. <laughs> and to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Phantom, that wonderful young man that did my intro for me. Thank you once again, Phantom. You are awesome. Weed. Weed. Four twenty. It's four twenty somewhere, isn't it? You know, you can do that whole cosmic thing, can't you? Um, let me see. I gotta, I gotta share this one because it's like, whoa, dude. Here, see, this is what I saw earlier. Yeah. Ooh, no, they doing hash. Hasha, 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 hasha. Is it like corned beef? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Now, I need to get to, where do I want to get to? You know, because this whole exposing crime is treated as committing a crime. We got to go here. Um, this is from themaven.net. And uh, Blue Lives Matters. Mm. California farmer charged with 12 felonies after trying to register his guns. Well, you know, he's trying to abide by the law and winds up, you know, it's one of those damned if you do, damned if you do, damned if you don't. In other words, heads, they win, tails, you lose. That's kind of the way it works, because when they write the rules, they, they always win. Mm hmm So, apparently a farmer was charged with 12 felony weapons offenses after trying to comply with a new law. This was in Bakersfield, California. A member of a prominent farming family was charged with a dozen weapons-related felonies after he attempted to comply with California's state-mandated gun registration laws. Do you not understand that gun registration is just basically giving them a list of where to go first? Do you not understand? It's kind of like that concealed carry shit. Ooh, not only does this person have a weapon, but they also know how to use it, and they could be carrying it out there on their body, and we don't know it, so shoot first, ask questions later. It's a list for them to go off of when they decide to start gathering shit up. In any case, back to this article. According to court documents, Jeffrey Scott Kirschman's a uh, home was raided in April after he attempted to register an AR-15 using the state of California's website, KGET. <clears throat> or use their website, KGET reported that. Kirschman is the CEO of Scott Kirschman Farms, Inc., uh, which is one of the chief potato suppliers for Frito-Lay. Arriba, arriba, andale, andale, eja, it's Frito-Lay. Ah, frito. See, there's that taco meat sock. <laughs> the businessman was attempting to comply with California's ever-tightening gun laws, one of which requires gun owners to register assault-style weapons by the end of June. Okay, an assault-style weapon. So does that mean baseball bats? Um, 
pry bars. Uh, what's what's that thing called for changing uh, tire? Uh, tire, whatever. That could be used for an assault weapon. A hairbrush. I've seen a hairbrush used. I've actually, as a child, had one used upon me in an assault case by my mother. <laughs> she got my attention real quick and I sat still. Um, let's see. Uh, what else are you, should you register? A rolling pin. That's an assault weapon. Um, let's see. A bullwhip. That would be an assault weapon. Uh, what else could we... Assault weapon. You know, you could... Some people's cooking could be an assault style weapon. Uh, I could go on forever. Do you really want me to? I don't think so. He electronically submitted photographs of his AR-15 as part of the registration process and soon became the focus of a California Department of Justice investigation. Why? Because they ain't got nothing else to do. There's no other crime going on in California. No, all those really bad guys, they're very scary, and we might actually get hurt by them, but this person that's trying to actually abide by the law, yeah, they don't scare us because we got them scared enough to comply with the law. It's bullshit. In any case, according to court documents, the weapon was illegally modified and served as grounds for the DOJ to raid his home. Illegally modified. So what did he do? Have ammunition? It was not immediately clear what the illegal modification was. <laughs> but the rifle was presumably not in compliance with recent bans. Hmm... Investigators seized two silencers, three, 230 rounds of ammunition, and 12 firearms in the search. Why? Because they can. Because this Nimrod was Nimrodi enough to go on their website and register. On May 27th, the district attorney's office charged him with a dozen felony weapons-related charges and he was subsequently released on a $150,000 bond. So, not only did they get his weapons, but now they've got some cha-ching to go along with it, which is the whole thing. Um. <laughs> oh, sock, you silly. Um, you bake. Oh, I bake my bacon all the time. Yeah. I put, do my bacon in the oven on my, um, brain farts are us. Okay. Um, on my roaster pan, not roaster pan. Um, God, got dandruff, some of it itches. See, it's, it, I gotta be retrained. My brain just ain't working quite right. Um, broiler pan. That's what it is. That's what I do my bacon on is my broiler pan. That way the the grease all drips down and it doesn't wallow and yeah back to this distracted can you say squirrel <laughs> according to the Kern County Sheriff's Office commander Joe Pilkington a court recognized firearms expert ta -ta -ta -ta, he has a badge too California's rapidly changing gun laws have created a significant amount of confusion with regard to what requirements are currently mandated. Just in the last few years, there have been lots of changes in gun laws, according to Commander Pilkington. Making an effort, a good faith effort, to comply with these really complicated laws should count for something, but we're going to take your weapons and your money anyway. He also suggested that anyone who was struggling to understand the current requirements should meet with licensed firearm dealer. Ah, or contact your local, local law enforcement. I'm sure they will help you. This is, or there is this self-regulation application on the Department of Justice website, but it may be better to talk to an FFL. What the hell is an FFL? Because that's not a licensed firearms. Hmm. I don't know. 
Apparently, Commander Pilkington also said someone who has a license is that you should talk through whatever these complications are. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Boulder, Colorado has done something very similar. An assault-style weapon that has got a class action lawsuit against it. As I speak, I listened to the gentleman when I was going to pick up my grandchildren um, discuss it on the radio. The difference between a dead squirrel and a dead politician in the road, skid marks leading up to the squirrel. That is true, sock puppet. That is true, because there's never any... Yes, Flash Nasty, bacon makes my brain fart. <laughs> but it smells like bacon. So. <laughs> okay. Moving along. Hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of those brilliant things where you just kind of go, no, no. When they tell you you need to register these things, run away. Run away as fast as you can because those people are going to come and take them. Once they know what you've got, you will not have it for long. That's how they play the game. And trust me, it is a game to them. It really is. Oh, and there are so many people out there that fall for that shit. Okay. Now, on to the great state of Florida, since that's where Sock and the lovely Kate live, from the Tampa Bay Times. I saw this on Twitter, and I went, ah, until I saw that there was a tizzy and a to-do over it, and then I thought, why? So I had to go there. When a service dog gives birth at Tampa Airport, controversy takes flight. What a wonderful headline. And a picture of Mama with her babies. And it's like, aww. So, um, eight puppies born at the Airside F, or yeah, Airside F in Tampa International Airport last week were adorable instantly. Well, duh, they're puppies. And internet famous quickly and controversial not long after. The white golden retriever parents, a male named Golden Nugget and the pregnant Eleanor Rigby, were set to board an American Airlines flight to Philadelphia with owner Karen Van Adder. That's when Ellie went into labor, while Nugget jumped around like a nervous dad-to-be, as any dad-to-be would do if their significant other was going into labor at an airport. Because, yeah, next thing you know, you got all these damn TSA people copping a feel and all that other fun shit, and they don't know nothing, and... Oh, well, back to this article. It made national news, met mostly with congratulations and awes when the airport posted photos online. But photos drew substantial negative reactions from people complaining that the dogs were not service animals in their humble opinion. Yes, I see it flashing. Um... <laughs> Oh, Federal Firearms Loser. Thank you, Grim. I, yeah, I did not know that. Okay, Vinny. Everybody wants bacon farts? <laughs> I don't think so. In any case, <clears throat> for some, the puppies represent the latest gone viral disturbance caused by more dogs traveling on planes. American Airlines, for instance, said that in 20, from 2016 to 2017, it has seen as much as a 40% increase in dogs on its flights. The increase, the offended say, is driven by vague rules and an abundance of emotional support animals, unlike dogs that guide the blind or detect low blood sugar these animals soothe passengers suffering from anxiety, depression, PTSD, or similar issues. Trust me, once you go through the uh, TSA Grope and Tickle Brigade, 
you will have PTSD, anxiety, and depression or similar issues. So you need a puppy to cuddle with. That's why I don't go through there. Oh, and it's drawing distractions can be complicated. Apparently an increase in dogs lacking the training and temperament for commercial air travel, often a stressful experience even for humans, has led to reports of bad boys and girls blocking aisles, relieving themselves on seats, and even biting. And that's just the three-year-olds that are making mom say, Shut up, Jeffrey, and sit down. Oh no, apparently that's the doggies too. Yeah, take your doggie to do its business before you get on the plane because air pressure and... I don't know that for a fact, but I know the times that I have flown, as soon as they switch off that seatbelt light, I'm hauling ass for the bathroom because my bladder's going, it's time. <laughs> so, apparently some airlines have cracked down on which species can fly as support animals after people flew with birds and rodents. In January, a woman's emotional support peacock was turned away by United Airlines. Now, mm-hmm. Okay. You sure that wasn't just her child with the way cool, colorful hairdo? <clears throat> In February, a woman said that she flushed her emotional support hamster down a toilet after being told it couldn't fly spirit. Some emotional support you gave your hamster, woman. If you had to have that little hamster go on a plane with you or felt that you had to have that little hamster go on a plane with you, then you should have just foregone the flight instead of flushing your hamster. Talk about a doohickey. I was going to say something else, but I'll be nice just this once. Is that That's what happens when you spend a week and a half with grandkids. It's like your brain gets completely rewired. Apparently, Susie Wilburn, who is the director of admissions and alumni for Southeastern Guide Dogs, called the puppy birth at the airport horrendous and cruel to Ellie since dogs naturally seek privacy and solitude while giving birth. Hmm, but if it's like some other people, you know, like with when I remember when I was in labor with my girls and it wasn't one of those hello you have plenty of time to schedule this it was hello you better haul your ass to the hospital now cuz this kids coming out yeah apparently the instinct for the mother to clean up as well as the possibility for complications could have made for disgusting or traumatizing displays for unprepared travelers she said you know what sweetheart those of us that live out here in the country you know that those of us that we deal with this kind of shit on a daily basis you know we see them critters and they oh look they're having babies look at that and we are we let our youngins see that shit too because it's life it's natural it happens and if you're going to be traumatized by nature go home you are not prepared to be a traveler still the thing that bothered her most was that the dogs were referred to as service dogs there's no way a service dog could be pregnant really that's wilburn said that who is visually impaired and uses a guide dog you need your dog 365 days a year. That dog can't take a vacation. You can't give your dog maternity leave. It's also very rare that someone would have two service dogs. Hmm. Hmm. If it had been someone's pet, it would have been an adorable story. Aside from the fact that this pregnant dog shouldn't have been flying. No, she shouldn't have. But, you know, people sometimes just plain ain't got enough brains to... Ugh. Oh, well, it goes on to say, people who are trying to trump the process and get their pets on an airline, it makes people look at me funny with my dog and question if it's really a service dog. Well, I do understand that argument right there. Because I do think, you know, once you start giving people an inch, they are going to take a mile and there are going to be abusers. And instead of making everyone suffer because the abusers are jumping out and doing the wanny wanny woo woo stuff, you need to just knock the abusers back a little bit and say, excuse me, you need to grow a pair, hon. 
because just because you couldn't find someone to pet sit or you couldn't afford to hire someone to pet sit for you does not mean that you can take your critter on a plane. Drive. That's what I suggest. Drive. You don't have to go through the group and tickle thing either. Takes a little bit longer, but you get to see some of the countryside. I know what that's like. Hmm. In any case, standards set by the International Guide Dog Federation and Assistance Dogs International governing bodies that accredit organizations like Southeastern Guide Dogs say dogs that aren't spayed or neutered can never go into service. Baby guide dogs come from specialized breeding programs, and those dogs are for breeding, not working. Ah, in other words, puppy mill. Or am I reading too much into that? Van Adder disagreed. She told that the Tampa Bay Times that Nugget and Ellie did not come from a specialized breeding program, just a regular breeder. They weren't trained by a service dog organization, but a private trainer who taught Nugget to help with a litany of health issues, including detecting dangerous drops in her blood pressure or blood sugar. Ellie is undergoing the same training, she said. She didn't have the dogs fixed because she's worried it could affect their hormones and lead to cancer, which she said happened to a previous dog. A 2014 study found a possible link between spaying and neutering and a higher risk of certain types of cancer, though experts say more research is needed and fixed, um, recommended fi fixing most dogs, which um, how would you like it if someone just recommended that we fix most of y'all? Hmm. Hmm. I'm not saying that we shouldn't spay or neuter our our pets, those that we take care of. But wow. And um, just as an aside, you know, since she brought up the whole cancer thing, I was listening to Dr. John Bergman, his True Health Tuesday from a couple weeks ago, and he talked about um, really stop and think about cancer. Cancer is a scam. Cancer is a hoax. Cancer is not a disease. It is a symptom of a dis-ease with the body. And stop donating money to all of those cancer foundations, cancer receipt research fund, cancer or whatever, whatever. Those people that are hitting you up for money because the next cancer patient could be yours. Yeah, do you know that they did a, a survey of oncologists and they were asked, um, this was in 2014 was the latest survey, they were asked if one of your loved ones um, was diagnosed with cancer, would you give them chemotherapy and radiation? And 88% said no. 88%. Now, if an oncologist would not give the same treatment to their loved ones, why the hell, <clears throat> excuse me, are they doing it to the rest of us? Because of the frickin' money, that's why. That's why. Cancer is not a disease. They have been looking, researching for a cure to cancer for, what, 80 years now? and still haven't found anything different than chemotherapy and radiation, you know, the recommended and accepted treatments for cancer. Note they say treatments, not cures. Treatments. And they don't tell you that after five years, the uh, survival rate is less than 5%. They also don't tell you that you will get secondary cancers as well, or the likelihood of developing a secondary cancer is 97%. So, I understand her fear. You know, neutering or spaying her dog, it may get cancer. It will affect the hormones. And hormones, you need to, your everything is interconnected. Whether it's an animal's body or a human's body or a tree or grass or what, it is designed to re repair itself. It's designed to do that. It has cycles. And every time you mess with that, 
you mess with that design and that cycle and you screw shit up so tangent huh <sighs> back to this these are absolutely service dogs. I stand by that, Van Adder said by phone on Wednesday. There's no reason a service dog can't be pregnant. That's absolutely wrong, which, yeah. <clears throat> Apparently blurring the lines further is how Van Adder additionally describes Ellie and Nugget as both emotional support animals and her pets. Why can't they be all of the above? I wear multiple hats. Something the ID, IGDF, uh, if it was ID, I don't give a, <clears throat> IGDF Assistance Dogs International and Southeastern Guide Dogs don't do. Mm -hmm. But even while most disagree with Van Adder, a spokesperson for Assistance Dogs International agrees that there can be legitimate service dogs that are privately trained as Ellie and Nugget were. So, apparently... The doggy having puppies, okay, some were traumatized because uh, uh, nature happening right here in this environment where there's a bunch of unnatural shit going on. So, you know, somebody's apparently concerned that someone will be traumatized over this. Or, well, they can't be service dogs. Not in my opinion. Oh, as if your opinion is gospel truth. Speaking of the gospel, it was written by men. Just saying. Those that were touched. No. I've, 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 I'm frustrated with this. It's like, really, people? You're having shit fits. This, mm -hmm. there are multiple sides to this equation, and none of them sound like they're really something that, it's like, what, well, mm, uh, uh, drive, sweetheart. Avoid the confusion. Avoid the craziness. Drive. Drive. Hmm. Tape, tapered so your ass doesn't slam shut. Oh my God. I don't know that I want to know about that. <laughs> Beetle! I see you. Okay. Um, I thought the puppies were adorable. I thought it was way cool. Yeah, sure, you know, everybody's going, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, which, yeah, I would do the ooh, ah, ooh, ah. I would not get all butt puckery over the, that can't be a service dog, really? Hmm. Well, you know, <clears throat> I think uh, Elizabeth Warren can't be a Native American either, not as, or an of the indigenous tribes of America. But, you know, if she was born in the United States, then she's a Native American. You know, she identifies as one. If these doggies identify as service dogs, shut the hell up, quit your whining. Quit making a big old stew. Huh, <sighs> puppies. See, that's just me, puppies. Okay. Now that I've found the really weird stuff. Um, actually, it's not the really weird stuff. I've found other things that were not quite so weird. But here's one that I also saw on Twitter that I thought I would go to because I keep seeing all this stuff from Roseanne Barr and you know I th I way 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 back when uh, when she first started calling herself a domestic goddess and she was doing stand-up comedy and she had a couch on the stage and you know talking about how it was a bonus round if you found change in a Cheeto while cleaning the couch you know that kind of stuff I used to enjoy Roseanne Barr then I thought ooh this woman's gone a little you know, off kilter, just a little, but, you know, I'm not living her life, so, you know, maybe I'd be more off kilter than I am now if I lived her life, uh -huh, scary, so, from steamit.com, find five things for America to ignore, while arguing about Roseanne Barr, yeah, oh, Roseanne Barr, she's so horrible. She said things that were tame compared to what the ladies on The View say or what some of the people on CNN say or what some, what just about anybody says. This was really pretty tame. You know what? I actually agreed with her. <laughs> Who? Damn, I'm going to be in trouble now. Like I care. 
Apparently, the internet has been swamped, I tell ya, with frenzied articles, posts, and social media wars over Roseanne Barr's racist tweets and ABC's subsequent cancellation of her recently rebooted show. Oh, my God. OMG. People are squabbling over her right to free speech, the network's right to cancel the show, the hypo hypocrisy of right-wingers backing Roseanne's right to free speech while they deny the right of NFL players to allegedly disrespect their, spe their special national song and piece of cloth. Okay, well, you know, I don't give a shit about a national song or a piece of cloth. I don't care about either one of those. And you know what? If you listen to a lot of the, uh, oh, that's that are out there that are saying, you know, that's the kind of shit that I fought for. That was their, that was their thought process. It was like, I went to war because I wanted to, they, they don't realize the whole reason behind the wars. You know, maybe some of them do. I don't know. But yeah. There's a lot of people that didn't have a problem with it. It's it's those and you know that all got started when they wanted to get people to start being very patriotic again and the government actually asked the NFL to start doing that shit. Yeah, do some research, peeps. This is all a show. In any case, meanwhile, the U.S. government's inane and depraved brutality and incompetence continues unabated, regardless of how triggered its subjects are over famous pill poppers. Mm, and I don't care if she pops pills either. That's her business. So here's a sampling of things that are more consequence to humanity than a crazy celebrity's incoherent rambling and a Hollywood entertainment company's re uh, reaction to them. Um, we'll find out. I'll, I may have to agree to disagree or disagree to agree or something. Number one, in between complaining about how Disney's Bob Iger treated him, POTUS Trump slapped a 25 cent uh, percent tariff on goods coming into the country from China a move that ultimately burdens working Americans. It covers a $50 billion worth of goods. Hmm. Well, I'm, I think it's all stupid, but, you know, I would like to totally trash the monetary system, but that's going to take some doing. Because I don't think we need money. That's just a whole bullshit thing. My humble opinion, or we should not need money, should not need money. Let me put it that way. But yeah, that's a, that's a whole other discussion in any case. Number two, the Department of Homeland Security has doubled down on its plans to monitor journalists, an example of threatening free speech that follows previous government efforts to keep tabs on the press and reports critical of the state. DHS insists there's no reason to worry. We're here from the, we're from the government, and we're here to help. Yeah. Come right this way. We have a lovely room for you at the Gray Bar Hilton. We know it's rather dark and dank. Several floors down as well. Food's not so good, but hey, you have a rat that comes to visit once a day. <clears throat> yeah. Douche the government, too. I'm, I'm in a mood. Number three, exponentially more people died in Puerto Rico as a result of a Hurricane Maria than previously reported. The government's official death toll is 64. In truth, it's over 4,600. That's according to a survey published this week in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's more than 70 times the government's tally. The U.S. government's response to the natural disaster in the U.S. territory was wildly insufficient, and people are still struggling to recover and survive. Oh, Puerto Rico is nothing compared to Haiti and all kinds of other places, sweetheart. Anytime you get the government involved, they are always going to uh, set aside the maximum amount of finances possible and put forth the least amount of effort possible. That's just what governments do. Unless it comes to confiscating your guns, and then they'll take your guns, and then take your money, too. Yes? 
I'm sure I've got someone giving me shit. Hi, uh, Chloe. Oh, that sounds like fun, Sock. Oh, Pippi's walking around with a Fritos bag on her head. How funny. Silly Pabby. That's something my cat would do. In any case, uh, number four, the Department of Justice approved Bayer's takeover of Monsatan, sealing the collaboration of two of the most corrupt corporatist companies in the world. Did you know that Bayer is one of the surviving remnants of the massive a uh, company that was involved in a lot of the nasty, shady things going on during Hitler's Nazi thing. Yeah, that, that company was broken up into three separate corporations, which now Bayer is like the big da 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 and yeah so let's take the medical and the the poisoning of the plants and put it all together into one under one umbrella that's just brilliant and number five the trump stilskin administration is covering up civilian deaths and overseas wars even more than dangleberry's administration it's called propaganda hun that's what they do they do it well which also tried to keep the numbers under wrap. Mm, but apparently wasn't doing a very good job. This is a particular concern considering the number of bombs dropped by the U.S. military has skyrocketed under Trump Stilskin in the last week. The House of Representatives passed the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, which the ACLU has warned will enable true global war without end as if that's not going on right now and allow the u.s to declare war on a person uh, they've uh, they're already doing that if that you're just giving them permission turn the power to declare war almost entirely over to the potus and every future potus mm, been there done that been doing it for a while and grant further authority to any POTUS to use the military to lock people up with no charge or trial honey I don't know if you haven't been paying attention but that's been kind of sort of the storyline for years oh but in other recent stories hardly anyone was paying attention to even before the Roseanne feeding frenzy began this week the NSA is back to collecting records or record amounts of private data the TSA is compiling a list of unruly travelers financial experts are warning the economy is on its way to a massive correction the law enforcement agents are molesting children raping women beating unarmed civilians and responding to citizen complaints about children selling lemonade for charity but by all means carry on about Roseanne this was an op-ed that was written for anti-media so Yes, there's always smoke and mirrors going on. Design, build, install. Sounds like loads of fun. Let's see. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Ben Billions. Who's I gotta I gotta click on this. I gotta see who Ben Billions is. Cause I'm thinking mm, billions and billions. Do I wanna know? Latest tweets from Ben Billions. Who gives a? <laughs> okay, never mind. Never mind. I'm going to put this Roseanne thing over here in the effing site real quick. <clears throat> and look at the little birdie. It's all a load of poo. Every bit of it. See, people don't have, have a problem with struggling with depression. People have a problem struggling with reality. That's what they have problems with. They get depression from struggling with reality. 
I don't. I have a tendency to laugh at it because it's like, are you kidding me? Seriously? I mean, there are times I scream, but uh, I usually do that on the radio. Okay, now to the pocket. Pocket, pocket, pocket. Okay. I don't remember who shared this originally, but I threw it in my pocket earlier today. Speaking of propaganda and all kinds of other fun stuff. Um, yeah, I got another one on that too. So, this is from aljazeera.com. I don't remember if I got this off of Twitter or where for sure. In any case, memo to Israel. <clears throat> Lebanon is not Hezbollah and Gaza is not Hamas. No matter how many times you say, we are trying to destroy Hamas. No, you are turning into the monster that you did not even suffer under. Hmm. Israel is trying to bury inconvenient facts about Lebanon and Gaza. Ah, shock, shock. Um, okay, later, Vinny. Have fun. So, Israeli public relations efforts to uh, turn attention away from inconvenient realities and distract public opinion rest in large part on promoting simplified, dumbed-down messages. Those are easily parroted by com complicit media outlets, think tanks, pundits, and by some journalists who prefer the sensationalism of Iranian mullahs and Hezbollah plots and Hamas terrorists to the more complicated dynamics of the region and individual countries. Of course, in some situations, this is a good way to avoid an uncomfortable discussion about apartheid and occupation for fear of being labeled anti-Semitic. One clear example of such dumbed-down messages is Israeli's education minister Naftali Bennett's Lebanon equals Hezbollah tweet after Lebanon's parliament el parliamentary elections on May the 6th. Israel will not differentiate between the sovereign state of Lebanon and Hezbollah and will view Lebanon as responsible for any action from within its territory, he said in a tweet. Well, then I guess we will hold all of you responsible for anything that um, ooh, your little secret covert agencies do. How's that sound? It was Bennett, again, who in mid-May said that an unarmed Palestinian protesting near the border fence in Gaza should be treated as terrorists. By then, the government he is part of had framed the Palestinians' great march of return as a Hamas ploy. What Israel aims to achieve by promoting this type of rhetoric is to turn both Lebanon and Gaza into legitimate targets for its aggression in any conflict that might take place in the future. Oh, but we said that, that they said and they did and, well, we feel bad and so therefore, wow, and people wonder where the PC Brigade came from over here. I think they have great teachers over there. Such a shining example of how to manipulate. Let's just sling mud instead of throw out facts, shall we? Oh wait, I'm doing that too, aren't I? Huh. Apparently, Lebanon is not Hezbollah. For those familiar with Israeli policies in Lebanon and the history of the conduct, this is nothing new under the sun. Israeli officials have made it a habit to regularly threaten the entire population of Lebanon and not only Hezbollah with destruction, annihilation, and blowing it back to the Stone Ages. This inflammatory language, in fact, describes war crimes which Israel has repeatedly committed on Lebanese territory. In the 2006 war, the Israeli army killed 1,000 civilians, and the Israeli government tried to blame it solely on Hezbollah, because they are the scapegoat of the month, don't you know? 
But as a Human Rights Watch report investigating crime, war crimes committed during that conflict pointed out, responsibility for the high civilian death toll of the war in Lebanon lies squarely with Israeli policies and targeting decisions in the conduct of its military operations. Oh, I think they've done this for a while now, haven't they? What was the name of that U.S. ship that they were attacking when LBJ was president? Go back a ways. You'll find it. That's enough clues for you to find it. I'm not doing all your work for you. This year, it was not only Israel who chose to read the May 6 elections from the prism of Lebanon equals Hezbollah, but international and some Arab media were quick to dub the electoral results an outright Hezbollah victory. You know when you keep getting shit on, keep getting shit on, keep getting shit on, keep getting shit on, eventually the bad guys you know don't look nearly as bad as the bad guys that everybody else is supporting. This prompted local media and analysts to respond by pointing out that Hezbollah's electoral domination is a myth and a reductionist, inaccurate way of understanding what happened on May the 6th. There are many levels when it comes to reading the results of the Lebanese elections, and framing them as Lebanon equals Hezbollah outcome does not capture the complexity of what is happening in Lebanon today. This is absolutely not to say that Hezbollah is not a powerful political and military force in Lebanon, or that the party does not pose a very serious challenge and obstacle to the emergence of a strong state. Hezbollah's weapons also play a role in Lebanese politics, as we saw in the organization's May 2008 armed takeover of Beirut, and also in its decision to get involved in Syria, without consulting with the government or parliament. Indeed, one has to be very naive to claim that Hezbollah is merely a resistance movement and that its arsenal has no bearing on internal affairs or elections, both parliamentary and presidential. But claims that Lebanon is now hostage to Hezbollah and Iran are exaggerated. They are music to the ears of Israel, which promotes this line to justify whatever war crimes its army will commit in any future conflict in the name of, note, in the name of self-defense and war on terrorism, a.k.a. national security. That's such a wonderful umbrella that so many different countries tend to use. Gaza is not Hamas. Similarly, in Palestine, we have seen an attempt to paint the recent protests in Gaza as Hamas-led and inspired, despite the fact that the organizers come from multiple Palestinian political and civil society groups. Israel reports that Gaza equals Hamas equation to justify the killing of 114 unarmed protesters and the injuring of thousands who were simply marching for their right to return to their home and for an end to the occupation of Palestinian lands. Land grab. This line was repeated immediately by some Western governments and media. Washington Post, for example, published a disgraceful editorial claiming that the protests were Hamas's way of launching a war and an attempt to breach the border fence in the calculation that many would be killed. Oh yes, that's a wonderful way to launch a war with protesters walking around and when they start seeing people falling because they're hit by sniper fire, they pick up rocks and throw them back. That's a really smart way to fight against sniper, sniper fire, don't you think? It's a smart way to get yourself shot if you want to get shot. Smoke and mirrors. As in the case of Hezbollah, Hamas is not an innocent actor. No, it's not. It's been implicated in human rights violations in Gaza and breaches to international humanitarian law during armed conflicts. However, 
takes a special kind of moral and intellectual bankruptcy to deny the facts on the ground. Facts that are attested to by various United Nations and rights organizations. Indeed, the dehumanization of Palestinians has reached such an extent that even the human right to protest inhumane and unjust political and humanitarian conditions is denied them. As pro-Israel commentator wrote, trying to justify the use of lethal force against protesters, all Israel wants from Gaza is peace and quiet. In other words, shut the fuck up and go die over there. That's what they want. But instead, its peoples decide to protest, as if, in 2018, protest is a crime punishable by death. Well, honey, doesn't surprise me in California... Registering your weapons apparently is a crime punishable by God knows how many years in jail, confiscation of your weapons, and payment of cha-ching. The post-truth logic. When Va Vasile Neben Nebenzia, Russia's permanent representative to the UN, described the humanitarian outcry over Eastern Gouda last February as mass psychosis, I wrote about his statement in a column for Al Jazeera, calling it an example of the post-truth logic. Unsurprisingly, the White House's deputy spokesperson, Raj Shah, and the U.S. permanent representative to the U.N., Nikki Haley, fit in perfectly, along with their Israeli allies, within such post-truth reasoning. In response to the Gaza massacre and the cold-blooded shooting of Palestinians by Israeli snipers, Shah called the protest an unfortunate propaganda attempt, whereas Haley <clears throat> did not have the moral courage to face her Palestinian counterpart at the Security Council and instead walked out of the meeting room. Yeller? Indeed, post-truth logic can't handle the truth. The reality of what happened in Gaza does not reflect the dumbed-down talking points we've been hearing from pro-Israeli pundits and officials on TV and in the press. The truth of the matter is, as the UN Human Rights Commissioner put it, this was not a PR victory for Hamas. It was a tragedy for thousands of families and the stark contrast in casualties on both sides is also suggestive of a wholly disproportionate response. Israel's occupation and apartheid regime must end in order to reach a just peace, both for the sake of Palestinians and Israelis. This is what the Gaza protests were essentially about and any attempt to frame them as a declaration of war or simply as a Hamas ploy or a PR victory misses the point and is a transparent attempt to distort reality and maintain the status quo in favor of Israel. I don't know about y'all but I'm getting really tired of this shit over there. And I think we, as in USA, the government, needs to stop giving Israel money and weapons and a free pass. They need to stop. You know, you are judged by those you associate with. And it's no wonder the U.S. is looked down on by a bunch of the rest of the world. Okay, and if that wasn't enough, <laughs> oh, see, I haven't been doing a Friday for a long time, and so I have to have to get caught up on my ranting and raving and bitching and moaning and groaning and all that fun stuff. So. Just to let you know, this is from blacklistednews.com. 
The Council on Foreign Relations says that domestic propaganda is necessary. Did you know that? I did not. Apparently, one year ago, a State Department press event included quite possibly the most epic deer-in-the-headlights moment in all of government press briefing history. During the final press briefing in May of 2017, the State Department put high-level official Stuart Jones at the podium to give the daily briefing. And he was asked how the U.S. could call for democracy in Iran while ignoring the fact that one of Washington's closest Middle East allies is an oppressive autocratic state with an opaque legal system run by strict Islamic Sharia courts. Well, Stuart Jones, who was appointed as U.S. Ambassador to Iraq by former President Barack Dangleberry in 2014, before assuming the title of Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs in January, took a long, silent pause after an agent's, um, agency France press reporter asked the official how POTUS Donald Trump Stilskin could criticize Iran's democracy while standing next to Saudi Arabian officials. Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy where every position of power is point, appointed by either the king or other members of the al Saud royal family, from which the nation derives its name. Trump recently visited Saudi Arabia, a close ally of the U.S., and took the opportunity to deeply criticize the two nations' mutual foe, Iran, and its commitment to democracy weeks after it held its presidential selection. Now, though clearly hilarious and at the same time appropriately awkward, the incident highlighted the fact that mainstream journalists rarely ask the obvious questions that might so easily expose the glaring hypocrisy of U.S. foreign policy and its leaders. As Why Does Sleep in America blog so aptly described in lieu of delivering an actual answer, Jones became visibly uncomfortable, sighed audibly, stared blindly into nothingness, and said nothing for roughly 18 seconds. You could see the squeaky gears laboring to rotate in his head. You hear the faint trickle of urine down his thigh, and you could feel Jones praying to be suddenly whisked away by a dragon-drawn chariot sent to him by the sun god Helios. It's so beautiful and epic that we thought it deserved its own anniversary of remembrance. But, on a more serious note, about six months after Stuart Jones's internal meltdown moment, a leaked State Department memo obtained by Politico spelled out how Washington merely values the concept of human rights insofar as it can be molded toward propaganda ends. The leaked government memo, made public for the first time in December of 2017, instructed top State Department leadership that allies should be treated differently and better than adversaries. Huh. Shock, shock. For this reason, the leaked internal State Department memo argued we should consider human rights as an important issue in regard to U.S. relations with China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. And this is not only because of more moral concern for practices inside those countries, it is also because pressing those regimes on human rights is one way to impose costs, apply countermeasures, and regain the initiative from them strategically. As the May 2017 Stuart Jones presser demonstrated, this means that countries like Saudi Arabia or Qatar will always be let off the hook, in spite of, for example, U.S. ally Saudi Arabia executing over 50 people so far this year, half of them related to nonviolent drug charges. That's according to HRW. Or this might further translate into government officials choosing to look the other way, 
when allies illegally possess or pursue nuclear or other banned weapons. Politico explained that the memo encourages government leadership on up to the level of Secretary of State that we should do exactly what Russia and Chinese propaganda says we do. Use human rights as a weapon to beat up our ad adversaries while letting ourselves and our allies off the hook. Yeah, because what would happen if Russia were to do to us what we've done to nations all over the world if they would have done that to us after, say, ooh, Waco? Hmm. More recently, one year after the incredible and embarrassing State Department scene, the Council on Foreign Relations, or CFR, excuse me, has delivered an even more astounding propaganda fail which went largely unnoticed in the media. The CFR is among America's oldest and most established think tanks, with a who's who of government insiders filling up the ranks and has often played an adversary or advisory role, excuse me, on important policy questions to elected officials. CFR's Richard Stengel, a former editor of Time magazine, told an audience at a CFR event in late April called Political Disruptions, Combating Disinformation and Fake News, that governments have to direct propaganda toward their own populations. That's uh, one of those things that was authorized in a previous N NADA, National, yeah, NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, whatever. Yeah, it's okay to propagandize your own people. In other words, liar, liar, pants on fire. At the Council on Foreign Relations Forum about fake news, Former editor at Time Magazine, Richard Stengel, directly states that he supports the use of propaganda on American citizens, then shuts the session down when challenged about how propaganda is used against the Third World. Stengel himself, a former high-level official who headed the U.S. Office of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs at the State Department from 2013 to 2016, is also a regular pundit on MSNBC. He explained that basically every country creates their own narrative story and you know my old job at the State Department was what people used to joke as chief propagandist job. Wow if a moniker ever hit more aptly I don't know what it would. Uh, we haven't talked about propaganda. I'm not against propaganda. Every country does it and they have to do it to their own population and I don't necessarily think that's awful. See we have to do it for your own good because you just wouldn't understand the complexity of the lies that we spin. Stengel's personal bio no, uh, site notes that he helped create and oversee the Global Engagement Center at the State Department whose official mission is to counter propaganda and disinformation from international terrorist organizations and foreign countries with a special focus on Russia. Yeah. But more worrisome for a guy who openly expresses views clearly implying that he's not against propaganda on the US government's own population is that he was recently named a distinguished fellow as part of the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. Two weeks ago, the DFR lab announced its team has partnered with Facebook to monitor disinformation and protect selections. The DFR lab defined the new initiative as follows. 
The Atlantic Council's Digital For Forensic Research Lab today announced a partnership with Facebook to independently monitor disinformation and other vulnerabilities in selections around the world. The effort is part of an initiative to help provide credible research about the role of social media in selections, as well as democracy more generally. The Digital Forensic Research Lab is launching a partnership with Fakeybook to support the world's largest community in its efforts to strengthen democracy. Though it currently receives little commentary or attention, it must be recalled that Dengelberry's administration lifted the prohibition on domestic propaganda in 2013. Disturbingly, we're probably only just now experiencing the beginning phase of what the State Department and intelligence agencies' propaganda planners had in mind when the domestic propaganda ban was overturned just a few short years ago. Yeah, they, they had it in mind way before then. They were participating in it way before then. They just came out of the closet and gave themselves to permission to be all right with it in 2013. Isn't that comfortable? No. So, liars, liars, pants on fire. Um, ooh, what's for dinner, Beetle? I don't know. <sighs> okay, put this over on the effing side. Ooh, I think I need to go check out the pig. Seeing as how I haven't been doing this for a while. Hmm, let's see. Where's a where's a shyster looking guy? Grimmy, do you have any modicon guy that looks like a shyster looking guy? <laughs> I'm trying to find the shy the shyster and it yeah. That's what they all are. How about I just do this little guy? Because it's like okay, where'd he go? I scrolled too far. There. We'll do him. Okay. Let's go check out the pig. Oh. Anybody good at shoulder rubs? <laughs> My shoulders are really starting to feel that mowing everywhere inside the fence with a push mower. Ow. Okay. Word of the day over here on the pig. Social media, it is a noun. It's a region of cyberspace where correct Nick Cretans whip, uh, whip up howling progtard mobs from their safe spaces in mommy's basement. Hmm, yeah, pretty much. Or they share pictures of what they're having to eat. That's pretty much all that social media is for. In the quotable quotes section, Socialism is the doctrine that man has no right to exist for his own sake that his life and his work do not belong to him, but belong to society, that the only justification of his existence is his service to society, and that society may dispose of him in any way it pleases for the sake of whatever it deems to be its own tribal collective good. That was from Ayn Rand for the New Intellectual. Thank you, Ayn Rand. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Grim, that would work. Oh, Beetle, that would be so awesome. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh, they have oxymorons. Why isn't government right up top? It's oxymoronic. It just, it is. Number one. Is it good if a vacuum really sucks? Mm. Number two, why is the third hand on the watch called the second hand? 
Uh huh. That is an excellent question. Why is that? Number three, if a word is misspelled in the dictionary, how would we ever know? Oh, I would spell it properly because I spell phonetically. <laughs> Number four, if Webster wrote the first dictionary, where did he find the words? I'd, hey, I never thought of that one. Wow, and I, I come up with some pretty weird questions sometimes. Number five, why do we say something is out of whack? What is whack? Whack is what happens on Wednesdays when you get whack a doodly. That's what whack is. Number six, why does slow down and slow up mean the same thing? I don't know. I've never said slow up until just now. Number seven, why does fat chance and slim chance mean the same thing? I don't know. Huh. Covering both ends of the spectrum. Number eight, why do tugboats push their barges? That's a question for my brother-in-law. I will have to remember that and ask him. Number nine, why do we sing, take me out to the ball game when we are already there? Ha, huh. to make you ask why. Number 10, why are they called stands when they are made for sitting? <laughs> uh, day. Number 11, why is it called after dark when it's really after light? Yeah, that's true. After darkness fell, but did darkness fall or did it rise? Did the light fall and the darkness rise? Hmm. Number 12, does expecting the unexpected make the unexpected expected? Uh-huh. <laughs> Why are a wise man and a wise guy opposites? Uh, if I have to explain it to you, you obviously haven't met a wise guy or a wise man. Number 14. Why do overlook and oversee mean the same thing or mean opposite things? I don't know. I'd overlook and oversee mean opposite things. Huh. Okay. Number 15. Why is phonics not spelled the way it sounds? <laughs> uh, F-O-N-I-X, that's how it sounds. Uh, number 16, if work is so terrific, why do they have to pay you to do it? Because <laughs> that's the only way they get you to do it. <clears throat> number 17, if all the world's a stage, where is the audience sitting? Oh, sweetheart, go to social media, you'll find them. They're all sitting there going, and sharing pictures of their supper. Number 18. If love is blind, why is lingerie so popular? My mother said that the only reason for lingerie is to have on the nightstand in case of fire. I about shit bricks when my mother told me that. <laughs> hey. Number 19. If you are cross-eyed and have dyslexia, can you read it all right? <laughs> wow, now I'm going to look for a cross-eyed dyslexic and ask him that. <laughs> He'll be looking for a long time. Number 20, why is bra singular and panties plural? <laughs> I don't know. Huh. Uh wow, I really don't that that's a it's a head scratcher there. Number 21. Why do you press harder on the buttons of the remote control when you know the batteries are dead? Because it's like when you're talking to someone who speaks a different language as their native tongue and you speak louder because it will translate better when it's louder. I don't know. Number 22. Why do we put suits in garment bags and garments in a suitcase? Why do you park on a driveway and drive on a parkway? Oh, hey, oh, oh, uh, that's number 28. I jumped the gun. <clears throat> number 23, how come abbreviated is such a long word? I don't know, but I think it's redunculous. Number 24, why do we wash bath towels? Aren't we uh, clean when we use them? Yeah, my mother asks my brother that all the time. <laughs> 
just to get him to go, what, mom, come on, because she likes to mess with him, basically. Number 25, why doesn't glue stick to the inside of the bottle? It does, but it's just a very thin layer that does. Number 26, why do they call it a TV set when you only have one? I don't know of anybody that only has one. Either either have none or they have a couple. Number 27, Christmas. What other time of year do you sit in front of a dead tree and eat candy out of your socks? Well, when you put it like that, and when you take into consideration that those socks probably were not washed and they've been in a box for a year, and it's been years and years and years since they've been laundered. Hmm. Wow. Okay. This date in history. We got to move. Oh, good God. The pig guys even have something about Roseanne. Good Lord Almighty. Everybody's checking out Roseanne. And it's not the song from Toto. In any case, this date in history, the 1st of June. 1972, surrendering to a crippling fit of chronic crankiness, South Africa's Tswanaland changed his name to something even harder to spell. Baputhatswana. Huh? B O P H U T H A T S W A N A. Pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> that. Okay, this date in history, the 1st of June, 1980. Unrelenting media bias gets kicked up several notches when Ted Jane Fonda slept here. Turner penetrates a 24-hour news stinker named, <laughs> or not penetrates, <laughs> perpetrates. <laughs> oh, Freudian slip. I saw Jane. <clears throat> yeah, CNN. Yes, I see the flasher. Um, what's that? What did I mention? <laughs> Wackadoodle. Wackadoodle. What is it? Appalling in nature, unconventional verb to strike one with a hand or fist. Or to assassinate. Oh, I don't want to assassinate. I really don't want to strike someone with my hand or fist because that causes my hand or fist to hurt. But I don't mind being appalling <laughs> or unconventional. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, yeah, Roxanne. Roxanne was staying. Rosanna. Or there was Rosanna, Rosanna, Donna. You got a little ton of booger hanging off the end of your nose. Rosanna, Rosanna, Donna. God, I miss her. Um, dun, 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 dun. I still have a half an hour to go. Holy smokes, Batman. Um, where do I want to go? How about, we'll go here, World Truth TV, we'll go to that one first. Um, it is 43 outrageous facts most people don't know about the world around them. Are you ready? Number one. Oh, let's see. Well, let's start off with once you go down the rabbit hole, you will discover things that most people don't know. So here are 43 outrageous facts that most people are clueless about. Number one, the IRS is not a U.S. government agency. It is an agency of the IMF. Diversified metal products versus IRS et al. And it has all of the yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. Number two, the IMF is an agency of the UN. Reference Black Laws Dictionary. Number three, the U.S. has not had a treasury since 1921. 
Number four, the U.S. Treasury is now the IMF. Number five, the United States does not have any employees because there is no longer a United States. No more reorganizations. After over 200 years of operating under bankruptcy, it, it's finally over. Executive Order 12803, do not personate one of the or do not personate one of the creditors or shareholders or you will go to prison ah now i'm going to have to look up that executive order number 6 the fcc cia fbi nsa or eh, nasa never a straight answer and all the other alphabet gangs were never part of the united states government even though the U.S. government held shares of stock in the various agencies, as in U.S. versus Strang, hmm, and then Lewis versus U.S. Number seven, social security numbers are issued by the U.N. through the IMF. The application for a social security number is the SS-5 form. The Department of Treasury, IMF, issues the SS-5, not the Social Security Administration. The new SS-5 forms do not state who or what publishes them. The earlier SF SS-5 forms state that they are Department of Treasury forms. You can get a copy of the SS-5 you filled out by sending um, Form SSA-L996 to the SS Administration. Huh. Number eight, there are no judicial courts in America, and there has not been since 1789. Judges do not enforce statutes or codes. E executive administrators enforce statutes and codes. Huh. Number nine, there have not been any judges in America since 1789. There have just been administrators. And there are references to all of these, by the way. Number 10, according to the GATT, G-A-T-T, you must have a Social Security number. Uh, number 11, we have one world government, one world law, and one world monetary system. That does not surprise me. Number 12, the UN is a one world super government. Mm, that does not surprise me either. If they want to say so. I am a one world government. I govern my world. Number 13, no one on this planet has ever been free. This planet is a slave colony. There has always been a one world government and it is just that now it is much better organized and has changed its name as of 1945 to the United Nations. How wonderful. Number 14, New York City is defined in the federal regulations as the United Nations. Rudolph Giuliani stated on C-SPAN that New York City was the capital of the world and he was correct. Hmm. 20 CFR Chapter 111, Subpart B, 422.103, parentheses small, lowercase b, parentheses 2, parentheses 2. Yeah, there's the reference. Number 15, Social Security is not insurance or a contract, nor is there a trust fund. Helvering versus Davis. Yay. Number 16, your Social Security check comes directly from the IMF, which is an agency of the UN. Look at it if you receive one. It should have written on the top left, United States Treasury. Number 17, you own no property. Slaves can own no or can't own property. Read the deed of the property that you think is yours. You are listed as a tenant. Number 18, the most powerful court in America is not the United States Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Huh. Interesting. Number 19, the Revolutionary War was a fraud. Wow, more references. Number 20, the King of England financially backed both sides of the Revolutionary War. The Treaty of Versailles, July the 16th, 1782, and Treaty of Peace, eight, uh, stat, yeah, stat eighty, 
and as history repeats itself, Prescott Bush, father of George H. W. Bush and grandfather of George W. Bush, funded both sides of World War II. The Bush family have been traitors to the American citizens for decades. Sarah, if the American people had ever known the truth about what we Bushes have done to this nation, we would be chased down in the streets and lynched. That's George Bush Sr. speaking in an interview to Sarah McClendon in December 1992. Number 21. You cannot use the Constitution to defend yourself because you are not a party to it. Huh. Once again, there's references. Number 22. America is a British colony. The United States is a corporation, not a land mass, and it's existed and it existed before the Revolutionary War and the British troops did not leave until 1796. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to be doing some research in here. Of course, there's some wonderful videos attached to here as well. Number 24. The Pope can abolish any law in the United States. Elements of Ecclesiastical Law. Volume 1, 53 to 54. Number 25. A, ten, a 1040 form is for tribute paid to Britain. IRS publication 6209. Number 26. The Pope claims to own the entire planet through the laws of conquest and discovery. That's from the Papal Bulls. And I'm thinking a single finger salute to that some bitch right there. Number 27. The Pope has ordered the genocide and enslavement of millions of people. Yes, the Pope has. Vile creature. Number 28. The Pope's laws are obligatory to on everyone. Another single finger salute to the Pope. Does the Pope shit in the woods? Number 29. We are slaves and own absolutely nothing. Not even what we think are our own children. Number 30. Military dictator George Washington divided the states, as states, into districts. Messages and Papers of the Presidents, Volume 1, page 99. Hmm. Number 31. The people does not include you and me. That's Barron versus Mayor and City Council of Baltimore. Number 32. The United States government was not founded upon Christianity. Reference Treaty of Tripoli. Number 33. It is not the duty of the police to protect you. Their job is to protect the corporation and arrest code breakers. That's Sap versus Tallahassee and Rife versus City of Philadelphia and Lynch versus North Carolina Department of Justice. Number 34. Everything in the United States is for sale. Roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, water, prison, airports, etc. So I wonder who bought Kath uh, Klamath Lake. Hmm. Number 35. We are human capital. That is Executive Order 13037. By the way, everything in the United States being for sale, that's Executive Order 12803. Number 36. The UN has financed the operations of the United States government for over 50 years and now owns every man, woman, and child in America. The UN also holds all the land in America in fee. Hmm. Number 37. The good news is we don't have to fulfill our fictitious obligations. You can discharge a fictitious obligation with another fictitious obligation. Huh. Cool. Number 38. The Depression and World War II were a total farce. The United States and various other companies were making loans to others all over the world during the Depression. The building of Germany's infrastructure in the 1930s, including the railroads, was financed by the United States. That way, those who called themselves kings, prime ministers, and Fuhrer 
etc., could sit back and play a game of chess using real people. Think of all of the Americans, Germans, whoever, who gave their lives thinking they were defending their countries, which didn't even exist. The millions of innocent people who died for nothing. Isn't it obvious why Switzerland is never involved in this fiascos? That is where the, intern the Bank of International Settlements is located. Wars are manufactured to keep your eye off the ball. And you have to have an enemy to keep the illusion of government in place. Number 39. The United States did not declare independence from Great Britain or King George. Number 40. Etymology of government means to control the mind. From Latin, Greek, guben, uh, gubernato, management, government. From ancient Greek, which it has the, yeah. Steering, pilot, uh, pilotage, guiding. And to steer, to drive, to guide, to act as a pilot. Plus the Latin mente, which is mind. Number 41, you don't own yourself. The Federal Reserve does. And the birth certificate is used to take away your natural rights. Your legal name is written in all capital letters because names are artificial persons, which are corporations. In other words, your legal name represents the corporate name that is used by the government to identify you. Like your legal name, the government also is also not real because it's a corporation. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, a corporation is an artificial person or legal entity created by or under the authority of the laws of a state. The process that allows the government to legally claim you as a corporation involves the creation of a fictitious you, which is the name written in all capital letters, and then tricking you to agree to be that artificial person or legal name. Number 42. All people born in the USA since 1933 are slaves or cargo. And it's all legal. And number 43. The following foreign countries are registered as corporations in the United States. Israel, Turkey, Italy, Hungary, Sweden, Finland, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, Jamaica, South Africa, Canada, and Australia. Interesting. Very interesting. Looks like I'm going to be doing some researching. Hmm. Uber driver kills passenger in Denver shoot. Holy shit! What the hey? Who got... Because my daughter has used Uber before, and she lives out in that neck of the woods. They better not have... Now, I would have heard something if it was my daughter, but... Um... Holy smokes. Yeah, and my daughter was not impressed with Uber. And, well... I was Uber Grammy for about two weeks there. <laughs> Holy carp. I put an awful lot of miles on my car. Awful lot. Oy, especially most of it over a five day time frame. But, okay. Now, I do have one other thing I wanted to get to. Before I got out of here, this is from um, come on, 
GovernmentSlaves.info from today. Why we were born to do more than just fit into the system, go to school, work, pay bills, and die. When I came across this discussion triggered by Josh Jones, a writer and musician based in Durham, North Carolina, from filmsforaction.org, I couldn't help but ponder just how many people out there feel the same way about work and what we do in exchange for food on the table and a roof over our heads, among other things. I know, Grim, lots of people. Hmm... I know. I know lots of people live in Denver. My daughter doesn't live in Denver, but she's taken Uber in Denver, and that kind of freaks me out. And it's like, I want to call her and tell her, don't use Uber. <laughs> she's a my kid. Oh, well. Back to this. From the day we were born, we are put into school for a couple of decades and told, not taught, how the world works. What path to take, why to follow it, and how to fit in and become a productive member of society. This basically means that we have to spend a large majority of our lives striving for a degree or a diploma in order to qualify to work long hours and subsequently earn the right to live. There are many other routes than, than that as well. Much more appealing, but they also require us to put in our time. This sentiment reminds me of a video published by School of Life, and there is a link, which brings to light the fact that no matter how little sleep we get or what problems we're having at home, mental blockages and other things can arise during the human experience. We are, and always have been, told that we must be at work on time, ready to go, without excuses. This does, doesn't seem normal or near natural, yet it's something we're forced into. Mental illness is on the rise. Take depression, for example, an issue that's now affecting more than 15 million adults, and that's just in America alone. Could the current human experience be one that's contributing to this rise? Are there more miserable, miserable people now because we basically spend our lives doing what we can to survive while ignoring what our hearts want? Are we not giving enough time to our wants and desires beyond the material world? And do we even have time to do so? Well, Josh sums it up quite well in his first paragraph. Why must we all work long hours to earn the right to live? Why must only the wealthy have access to leisure, aesthetic pleasure, self-actualization? Everyone seems to have an answer, according to their own political or theological bent. One economic boogeyman, so-called trickle-down economics or Reaganomics, actually predates our 40th president by a few hundred years at least. The notion that we must better ourselves or simply survive by toiling to increase the wealth and property or of already wealthy men was perhaps first comprehensively articulated in the 18th century doctrine of improvement in order to justify privatizing common land and forcing the peasantry into jobbing for them. My favorite part of that excerpt is the fact that he calls attention to the fact that all of us are simply working for a small group of elite people that through the corporations they run basically control almost all aspects of our lives. Their idea of globalization or new world order is one that requires our participation and our consent. This type of system, one in which basically all of us are economic slaves, is one that we've become accustomed to. A great quote comes to mind here. Humans are so strange. We can climb mountains, explore the deepest oceans, and travel to space. But for some reason, we can't pa move past this idea that we need political overlords who tell us what we can and can't do with our lives. That's from Unknown, or an anonymous quote. <laughs> 
So, while we blindly continue to follow others, the world has experienced something it has never really experienced before. A massive paradigm shift is happening. A shift in the way we view, feel, and perceive our world and the current human experience. Not everybody is happy. And how could they be? When living on a planet where you die if you cannot pay for your life, our passions and our heart's desires slowly drift out of sight unless we do something about it. While we've remained complacent and simply accepted the human experience for what it is, those that created our economic current economic model continue to destroy our planet and have absolutely no regard for preserving the integrity of the planet and all the life on it. At the same time, large amounts of information are kept from us. All we know of our world is what's given to us by the same people who designed this life for us, the corporate mainstream media. Information alone is a threat to so many corporate interests. This shift has come as a result of new information that's now hitting the eyes and minds of millions, if not billions. This became evident when alternative media sites that cover global corporate corruption as well as new discoveries in various fields that are ignored by the mainstream, like new energy. They started to receive up to a billion views per year. Furthermore, whistleblowers like Edward Snowden and organizations like WikiLeaks have also helped out hugely. That all stopped some of these sites, like CE, and they were labeled as fake news. An ironic title from mainstream media, isn't it? They even appointed who they felt just to determine what's real and what isn't, as well as started a massive campaign to censor information that doesn't come from mainstream media news networks. There's a lot more to the world than what we are presented with. But being so busy with our 9 to 5 and trying to survive, many people still can't be bothered about it. When presented with information that's outside the box, it's common for cognitive dissonance to sink in. What's most frustrating about the current human experience is that it doesn't have to be this way. This is where Buckminster Fuller comes in. Fuller, one of the most creative and interesting minds in modern history, once said, One in ten thousand of us can make a technological breakthrough capable of supporting all the rest. The youth of today are absolutely right in recognizing this nonsense of earning a wage. This is something that we at CE are well aware of. We've personally come across technologies that can revolutionize the planet, although it depends what consciousness is operating behind that technology, but it exists our entire planet could be in a modern way completely off the grid. There's so many wonderful creations and ideas out there that make a utopian society possible. It's so simple that most people have a hard time believing it. The idea that we don't really have to work to live on this planet and live a good life is still impossible to imagine for most. That's because we've been indoctrinated to believe that the current world economic model and globalization are the only way for humanity to move forward, when it's doing the exact opposite. In my opinion, food, clothing, shelter, and more should not require little pieces of paper along with bits of our soul to receive it. A human experience that utilizes all of our developments instead of concealing them. One in which our leaders look out for humanity and the best interests of our planet, instead of following the orders of their financial masters, is desperately needed. Michael Jackson's famous line, They don't really care about us, rings true. But it's not true for everyone. Along with this consciousness shift, this realization that the wool has been pulled over our eyes is the fact that consciousness interacts with our physical 
material world in ways that are not yet understood and that is encouraging that's an encouraging thought given humanity's change in thinking with regard to concepts that might not have fit the frame approximately a decade ago I won't give into any specific examples but I'll let you ponder how a utopian society would work or how all of our needs could easily be provided for scarcity is something that doesn't have to exist neither does supply and demand these are all creations by what's known today as the one percent the system was designed to benefit them not us something new needs to be created a new way of life that requires the complete shutdown and change of our current economic model just as fuller said you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete now this goes on for quite a bit and I'm gonna go ahead and share it with you and I'm gonna finish reading it when I get done here because I'm just about out of time so thanks y'all for listening in I truly do appreciate y'all putting up with me and uh, yeah it's been it's been a crazy crazy couple of weeks but I'm back and yes I will be here tomorrow with flash of Rooney dork for the last dork table for a while cuz I got lots of irons in the fire but be sure to stick around because later on this evening Grimner and Moose Girl will be on with the Freakers Ball once again tomorrow morning for me 11 o'clock central time noon eastern time dork table with flash a Rooney dork and myself also Grimner with the blues Sunday at noon eastern time Hal Anthony following him right directly with opening up a can of whoop ass on yo ass behind the woodshed and Gary Ellen Gigi's boo Sunday evening with the road less traveled so thanks y'all for putting up with me and for listening in I got a little over my time um, have an awesome rest of your evening and remember no matter how far away I go no how no matter how long I'm gone I still love you and I wish you all enough. Good night. <laughs>